Then will be the session with Dr. Kaniraj, which will be followed by a Q&A, which will be live streamed. And then will be awarding of certificate of participation, again from David. We'll escort you to a dinner afterwards. Thank you. So good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we have a little prepared introduction here, so if you all will bear with me, I'll read through it to you. Dear friends of the medical and clinical profession, it is my pleasure to welcome all of you to the third iteration of Treetop Hospital's continued medical education session. On behalf of the management, I would like to thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us at this event. Tonight, I have the honor of introducing this CME's facilitator, who will be presenting on arthroscopic interventions for shoulder pain. After earning his MBBS from Madras Medical College in India, this doctor began his training to receive an MS in orthopedics at the orthopedic department of Sawaiman Singh Medical College in India. During this training, he was awarded with the All India Best Resident Orthopedic Surgeon Award by the Bombay Orthopedic Surgery Society, excuse me, for his clinical and academic excellence. During his medical career, this doctor has worked at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences in New Delhi as the senior resident orthopedic surgeon, specializing in joint replacement and arthroscopic surgery. In addition to being accepted for the Australian Orthopedic Association accredited fellowship training in Australia, this doctor is among the few Indian doctors to have been accepted at the Clinique Générale in Anancy, France. He was awarded first prize for his research on giant cell tumors of bone by the Delhi Orthopedic Association and has published numerous articles and journals such as the International Orthopedic Journal, as well as various chapters and textbooks, such as Textbook of Orthopedics, created by the Indian Orthopedic Association. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to our orthopedic surgeon, who has unparalleled prestige, incredible experience in this field, and has worked hard to provide you with this informative and important CMA session. Welcome, Dr. Cunningham. Thank you. I just need to take the mic for the light. Yeah. Thank you, David. Good evening, everyone. At the outset, thank you to all of you for taking your time and coming for the CME. So today I'm going to uh, discuss in brief about orthoscopic interventions for shoulder pain. Uh, for orthopedicians, it might look a little basic uh, because I have tried to give an overall perspective because people from other specialties also uh, here. So it's as a mix of uh, all the concepts that I'm going to discuss. Okay. So shoulder joint is one of the unique joints in the body. We all know as compared to any other joint in the body, the shoulder has extreme degrees of mobility. If you take any other joint, for example, elbow, knee or ankle, it has got mobility in only one plane. You have flexion and extension. And there is certain degree of uh, movement, very limited in the other planes. But if you take shoulder, it has almost 360 degrees of mobility in the frontal plane as well as in the sideways plane. So you take, this has got almost 360 degree of mobility in two planes. This extreme mobility of the shoulder joint is made possible by the complex anatomy and the biomechanics of the shoulder. The same complex anatomy and biomechanics which gives the shoulder this mobility which is essential for a lot of day-to-day -day activity makes it prone to a large number of issues. If you see in an orthopedic clinic at least one third of the patient who come with the orthopedic issues are patients presenting with shoulder pain. So shoulder is such a common issue even not only restricted to orthopedics all other specialists see shoulder issues. It is seen by diabetologists, it is seen by cardiologists, it is seen by neurologists, neurosurgeons, general physicians, general surgeons, almost every patient suffering with shoulder 
such a common entity. Because it's a very complex thing, lot of research is being continually done in understanding the biomechanics of the shoulder and we are continuously learning a lot of new things. So things that we learned 10 years or 5 years before in the medical school has become no longer appropriate or no longer valid as of today. So some of the common facts that have become relatively invalid are all shoulder pain 10 years ago we used to diagnose all shoulder pain patients as periarthritis shoulder or PA shoulder. Whenever a patient came into the clinic with a pain in the shoulder, it was diagnosed as periarthritis or PA shoulder. You would be surprised to know that periarthritis is no more an actual valid scientific diagnosis. Why is it so? Periarthritis is a blanket term used to describe several different entities like three different forms of impingement, adhesive capsulitis, shoulder uh, scapular dyskinias, arthritis of the glenohumeral joint, AC joint, bursitis, calcific tendinitis, nerve entrapment, <coughs> upper cross body several different entities. All these entities differed in their etiology, differed in the pathogenesis and they differed in their treatment. So when the etiology is different, when the treatment is different, it is no longer appropriate to put them all together into the same basket and to label them as periarthritis or PA shoulder. If you are asking me where is the proof, if you go to PubMed and do a search for the term periarthritis shoulder, you will not find any scientific article in the last 30 years. All the articles that you can find is few articles from acupuncture related treatments where they use continue to use this term periarthritis. No English language article in the last 3 or 30 years uses the term or has an entity called as periarthritis shoulder. The second common thing was the most common cause of shoulder pain or movement in uh, restriction in diabetics was frozen shoulder. Whenever a patient said diabetic and then he had a movement restriction, we used to make a diagnosis of frozen shoulder or adhesive capsulitis. Now, what we have understood is the most common cause of pain or movement restriction in a diabetic is frozen shoulder. So, these are the common things that we thought which have been proved to be incorrect or not so appropriate at the moment. So, what are all the common shoulder problems that we see? In young patients, in people less than 40 years, the most common causes of shoulder pain are instability and lesions in the lateral tear. So instability, as soon as we say, we are often made to think that instability means recurrent dislocation. Locations refer to one end of the spectrum. There is a whole range of spectrum under instability, which I will be discussing in the next few slides. In elderly patients or people above 40 years of age, the most common shoulder conditions that we see are impingement of the rotator cuff, adhesive capsulitis of frozen shoulder, tears of the rotator cuff, and arthritis of the glenohumeral and acromioplatical joint. The most important thing whenever we need, we are dealing with a patient with shoulder pain that we need to remember is that shoulder and neck are interconnected. Because a lot of time patients with a problem in the shoulder can present only as pain in the neck. Or sometimes the patient vaguely points this area and says there is a pain in the neck. If you examine the shoulder, the shoulder might be normal, the patient might be having issues with the neck. Similarly, when a patient presents only with problems in the shoulder and then you don't examine the neck, you are likely to miss it. So whenever you have a patient with shoulder problem or a neck problem, it is very essential to examine the other area because the pain may be coming either from the shoulder or from the neck. So it's very essential that the other region should be examined in all patients. So this is the most common condition that we might be seeing in elderly patients or patients past middle age in our clinic. So what is this? So if you look here, this is the frontal pain, taken x-ray taken in the front. So this is the bone at the top where you put your finger, the acromion, and then this is the top of the humeral head. So there is a space between the acromion above and the humeral head below. This is called as the subacromial space, the space below the acromion. What is there in that space? If you look at it from the sideways, the entire rotator cuff muscle, the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, they are all sitting in the space here, subacromial space. This is the acromion, this is the coracoid, this is a tough arch above and then there is the bone below and then you have the rotator cuff here. So what happens in impingement is this muscles, the rotator cuff muscles which is responsible for the movement of the shoulder is getting rubbed between the tough bony arch above and the bone below. So impingement is nothing but rubbing of the rotator cuff tendons between the bones above and below. So it is nothing but friction. The muscle is getting damaged because of irritation between the bone above and below. So that is the impingement and impingement is a common thing that we see in our clinics with the shoulder patient. So, Rotator cuff impingement, why does it occur? 
we learn that rotator cuff impingement can be due to a lot of reasons and we generally believe that it was more due to a structural thing that was reducing the space. The space got narrowed and the bones were rubbing on the tendon because there was a structural lesion. The acromion uh, exists generally in four different forms. It is either an upturned or a flat one, it is little curved down or it is a curved even more down. So these are the different shapes of acromion in different people. So what happens is when you have an acromion instead of being flat when you have a curved or cooked one it automatically reduces the space below the acromion. So this one can reduce the space and can impinge on the muscles there and then it can produce symptoms. So the shape of the acromion was found to be or postulated to be one of the most common causes of impingement. The other causes were one whenever there is an arthritic change in the acromial uh, joint the osteophytes produced as a result of it the inflammation occurring as a result of it can narrow the space. Other thing when there is an inflamed bursa subacromial bursitis or there is a deposit like a calcific tendinitis this can reduce the space and then it can produce a impingement syndrome. So initial years we always believed that the impingement was because of a structural lesion that reduces the space in the subacromial space thereby producing a problem. But with more and more understanding of the biomechanics of the shoulder what we have realized it the impingement is not because of the structural thing. All these structural changes are secondary features that occur in a patient with impingement. They are not the cause they are manifestations of impingement. So what actually happens? I told you shoulder is an extremely complex joint. If you see here when you are going to lift the shoulder to overhead position what happens is the movement is not just occurring at this joint. This is the joint, the ball and socket joint between the shoulder blade and the humeral head. The movement is not just occurring here. The movement, if you are lifting the arm, it is occurring four joints of the shoulder. The shoulder consists of four joints. Number one is this glenohumeral joint and another is the joint between the shoulder blade and the rib cage here. And then you have a joint here, the acromioclavicular between the collarbone and the acromion of the scapula and then you have a sternoclavicular joint. So, if you are looking at what happens when you are lifting the arm above, the shoulder blade has to tilt. It has to move and tilt thereby creating space for the head to go overhead position. So that is what normally happens. So the movement if you have observed it occurs here, it occurs here, it occurs here and it occurs here. So this is the scapulothoracic rhythm that we know of. So when you are lifting the arm the movement is occurring at all the four places. What happens in impingement? is this scapula muscles are not working in cohesion with the muscles in the front. So what happens you are lifting the arm this acromion which should normally slide and open like when you go to a uh, automatic car park the beam has to go up to let the car go. What happens here this acromion which is normally supposed to tilt and let the humeral head go up does not do that. It is more common in diabetics because their uh, muscular uh, dystrophy or muscular dysfunction, neuromuscular dysfunction occurs in diabetics very early in the course of the disease even before the neuropathy or even before the vasculopathy occurs. This neuromuscular dysfunction is scientifically proven to occur more commonly in diabetics thereby making them prone for this impingement. The scapula not tilting so that the acromion tilts and allows in a normal way that is not happening. So what happens? The humeral head goes up, the acromion still saying that. You try to move your arm, the muscles that are in between get scarred. That is the simple pathology of the impingement. So now that we know it is more of a disturbance in the biomechanics, loss of the muscle tone or in simple terms the muscles of the scapula are not working that is responsible for the impingement. So having understood that now the treatment for rotator cuff impingement becomes very simple. The simple treatment is one activity or work modification. Certain activities tend to make the scapular muscles weak or alter the scapulohumeral rhythm. For example, an IT professional, somebody is sitting in front of the computer for long days, they think that they are not doing anything, just they are sitting and relaxing. But when they are sitting in an erect posture, the scapular muscle is still working. And then if they are not sitting in a proper position, that makes their scapular muscle to go to fatigue, that can alter the scapulohumeral rhythm. As I told you in diabetics there is a neuromuscular junction dysfunction that occurs early particularly in the upper limb muscles that makes them prone to develop impingement or if the work posture is not right that makes them all prone to develop this alteration in the scapulohumeral rhythm. So that activities that are whatever is going to cause this impingement that should be avoided. The common activity we see in household uh, women what they do is whatever items they commonly use for cooking they tend to keep it in the overhead position. They tend to every time grab it by reaching overhead that produces strain of the scapular muscles. 
For example, teachers are somebody who uses the blackboard. They will be reaching their arm too high to start writing in the board. That produces strain in the muscle. And if you are sitting in an office, your phone is on the opposite side. Every time you are turning or you are going across the body to reach some things on the other side, you do this movement repetitively. This makes your scapular muscles undergo fatigue. This can alter your scapulohumeral rhythm. So the activities that are repetitive, that involves overhead or across the body, those activities should be modified so that the scapular muscle rhythm can be maintained. The second thing is a phased shoulder rehabilitation program. I told you the main problem is the scapular muscles not working. So the program should aim at correcting the tone of the scapular muscles, making them to work in coordination with the other muscles. So when you do a phase two program where you first bring up the tone, you make the scapular muscles work in cohesion, then you do the strengthening exercises, the shoulder problem, the impingement will get corrected. Sometimes when the inflammation is very severe, the pain is so much that the patient is not able to do any exercise at all to correct the tone. That time we might need to give some injections into the subacromial space to reduce the inflammation, thereby the patient is able to do the exercise. Next is the subacromial decompression. Subacromial decompression is an arthroscopic procedure which is indicated in patients with impingement who had not responded to physiotherapy, exercise program or injections. They are continuing to have severe pain because the bursa is so much thick, it is not reducing with other modalities like physiotherapy medication. Or if the bony changes have become too prominent that they have a big acromial spur or they are having a big degeneration in the AC joint, then subacromial decompression to reduce the structural changes will help the patient reduce, have a reduction in the pain, thereby they can do exercise. So the primary treatment is exercise for subacromial decompression. All other things becomes an ancillary or supportive treatments so that you are able to allow the patient to do the exercise. So subacromial decompression used to be a very popular surgery in the past. Now we are very selective in patients who have significant structural uh, changes and they are not able to do physiotherapy in those patients. We do subacromial decompression and it gives a good relief. Subacromial decompression is nothing but whatever is the offending structure that produces the reduction in the space and produces the inflammation. We trim the bony spurs and then we remove the entire bursa and then we give the space back to the rotator cuff muscle so that they are able to move freely and then they are able to function normally. Next common condition that we see is an adhesive capsulitis or commonly known as a frozen shoulder. Normally, the capsule of the shoulder joint is a very loose structure. It's like a curtain that allows free movement of the shoulder joint. What happens in adhesive capsulitis is it becomes inflamed, very thick and then it is like plastered to the shoulder joint. So it literally restricts the movement that is occurring in the shoulder joint. When somebody tries to move the shoulder with the thickened capsule, what happens? It produces tremendous amount of pain. So the frozen shoulder, the capsule is very thick, it is inflamed and then it is preventing any movement between the uh, humeral head and the glenoid. So the risk factors, we all know, diabetes is the number one risk factor for developing frozen shoulder. Diabetes, particularly when there is present for a long duration or if it is uncontrolled, makes the patients prone to develop frozen shoulder. Lot of time, it's a secondary frozen shoulder, secondary to impingement. Then any thyroid disorder, either it is hypo or hyper, makes the patient prone to uh, develop uh, frozen shoulder. Dyslipidemia, this is a risk factor. Any injury to shoulder, not necessarily a bony injury, even a soft tissue injury. Somebody went in a bike, they had a fall, they went to the ER, x-ray was normal, they kept the shoulder without doing any movement for a couple of days, they can end up in frozen shoulder. Any soft tissue injury can produce frozen shoulder. Any major surgery, for example, the patient had a neurosurgery or a cardiothoracic surgery, they were resting in the bed, they were not moving their arms for some time, what happens is the shoulder can go into an adhesive capsulitis. So these are all the risk factors for frozen shoulder. So there are three different stages, uh, freezing, frozen and thawing that we all know of. But the important point to note that this is seen only in patients with idiopathic frozen shoulder. Most of the patients that come to us in the clinic, you will not be able to make a distinction as to stage 1, stage 2 or stage 3 because the patient will have a combination of these. In patients with the pre, uh, secondary to an impingement or secondary to diabetes, secondary to thyroid disorders, in all these patients, you will not see these stages separately. Anything else, frozen shoulder can just present with movement restriction in both active and passive pain and with pain, irrespective of whether you are able to classify into a stage or not, it is still adhesive capsulitis. 
So should we treat them at all? Because we have been traditionally told that the frozen shoulder will become with all right without anything. Just you treat the pain, you give them anti-inflammatory, you give them some physiotherapy. With benign neglect, we expect the frozen shoulder to treat. That was the traditional teaching. But what we have realized it, it is, though we, are, we say that it's a self-limiting, that's only for the pathological process. Several studies have documented, I would like to quote this study, it may not resolve for two years. The patient may continue to have pain and movement restriction for two years. In addition to that, the moderate residual symptoms remain. The patient tend to change their activities to shoot their movement restriction. Rather, they do not develop the full range of movement or they do not get a complete range of movement in the shoulder. So it's very essential that in patients with frozen shoulder, we, we instate our appropriate treatment so that they get good function at the shoulder joints. So frozen shoulder treatment will depend upon stage of the disease, if it is possible, in which stage of disease they are in. And the capsula segment. In frozen shoulder, it is not that the entire capsule is affected in all the individuals. In some individuals, there may be predominant involvement of the anterior capsule. They will have predominantly restriction of the external rotation. In some individuals, there will be the inferior capsule that is thickened. They will have predominantly restriction of the abduction. So the treatment will also depend upon the which segment of the capsule that is being primarily affected or predominantly affected. So the treatment options for frozen shoulder include the exercise physiotherapy with or without local kit. That forms the prime modality of treatment. The treatment is if the patient is in stage 1 where they are starting to lose motion, then you need to institute ROM exercises. So when they are doing a range of movement exercises, they do not lose the movements. So they will not develop the stiffness. So in stage 1, the predominant treatment will be to do ROM exercises. But when they are coming in the stage 2, where they have already lost some amount of movement, there the aim will be to give pain relief and to put them on stretching exercises. So stretching exercises is important in the third stage. In the uh, second, as well as in the third stage. So depending upon the stage, the exercises will need to be tailored. It is not that you generally send them to exercise and then they are doing random exercises that is not going to help them. And local heat plays a very important role. The heat can be either in the form of ultrasound or it can be in the form of IFT or it can be just hot fermentation at home. This is very important because it increases the blood flow, it makes the muscles supple, it makes the muscles soft so that they are able to stretch their tissues as well as the muscles and then they are able to regain uh, movement and this also gives excellent pain relief. Joint injections is very effective in frozen shoulder. I will be talking to you in the next few slides. Manipulation under anesthesia. In patients where the frozen shoulder is very uh, stiff and then it is not responding to exercise, these patients might require manipulation under anesthesia or an arthroscopic capsular release. In manipulation under anesthesia, we give anesthesia to the patient so that the muscles are relaxed and then move the shoulder in a particular sequence. We manipulate the shoulder in a particular sequence so that the adhesions are released so that they are able to regain their movements. But the frozen shoulder manipulation, we should be aware of two things. When the bone is very osteoporotic and if you are not gentle, there is a risk that you might injure the bones. If the muscles are weak and if you are not gentle, there is a risk that you might injure the muscles. So while doing a manipulation, it's very essential that we do it in a particular sequence in an atraumatic way and then we are very gentle. Arthroscopic capsular release is a procedure where with minimal keyholes you go in, you look at each structure, you assess which structure or which segment of the capsule is tight and then you release all those structures so that the patient has a very controlled release of the tight structures. The advantage is you have a reliable release of the structures and then reliable return of the shoulder movement. Second, you have a good post-operative pain relief in this as compared to uh, a manipulation alone. It's a simple procedure. The patient comes in the morning, they have the procedure done and then they can go home in the same day and then they can follow up with uh, physiotherapy. Manipulation sometimes tend to be very painful. The patient needs to stay for a few days uh, to continue with the exercises and for the pain management. So shoulder injection. Shoulder injection is a very effective treatment both for impingement as well as for aggressive capsulitis. So it's commonly prescribed. Patients get a lot of shoulder injections. And a lot of times, patients do not get relief with the shoulder injections as well. So, why is it so? If we see shoulder injection, as soon as we say shoulder injection, there are certain concerns. Generally, people ask, sir, are you going to give steroid? Is it okay to have a steroid injection? That's the first question most of the people ask. And then, the next concern that comes is, I told you that diabetes is the most single most important risk factor for developing frozen shoulder. So, when you are going to give steroid, 
into a patient with a diabetes, then it's a concern what is going to happen. So, the common concerns are giving steroids in diabetes and the effect on glycemic control. If you see, this is an article this is that looked at the systemic effect of intra-articular corticosteroids. When you give corticosteroids in the knee joint, the study found that there is a transient increase in the blood sugar levels for a few days in a patients with controlled diabetes. When it was given into the knee joint, there is a transient increase in the sugar levels. This is another article which says when you give the drug into the shoulder, in frozen shoulder, it does not alter the blood sugar levels. Both are right, but why do you think so? Why doesn't it produce alteration in the sugar level when you give it into the shoulder? Simple, it's because of the pathology. I told you in adhesive capsulitis, the shoulder is thickened. It's very tight, it is plastered. So if you deliver the drug into the shoulder joint, whatever minimal absorption that has to occur, even that is reduced. So, in a frozen shoulder patient, in a diabetic, if you deliver the drug into the capsule within the joint, then there is a very minimal or nil effect on the glycemic control in patients with good sugar control. So, we need not worry about giving a steroid in patients with diabetics for frozen shoulder if they have a reasonably good sugar control. Only analgesic effect. Lot of time people ask, is it, a is it a temporary or a transient relief? Because you say you are going to give a local anesthetic and corticosteroid. Should I get multiple injections? And whether it is going to be active only for a few days? If you see, this is one of the nice article where what they did was, after giving steroids uh, local anesthetic combination into the shoulders, they did biopsy of the capsules and then they studied what was happening in the capsule. They found that following an intraarticular administration, the number of fibroblasts, the vascular hyperphrasia, the fibromatotic reaction, which is the main pathology of the adhesive capsulitis, reduced significantly. So in other words, giving a corticosteroid well-timed and into the shoulder joint can be actually a disease modifying in patients with adhesive capsulitis. When you give it at the right time and you deliver it into the shoulder joint, that can modify the course of the frozen shoulder. They need not suffer for two years. Their disease process is arrested and they can have significant relief in pain and they can have a good range of movement. So as I told you, a lot of patients have the shoulder injection and then they come back saying, I had three injections, still there is no relief. Why does it happen now? The possible reasons are the drug did not reach the joint. Sometimes the drug may not have been delivered into the shoulder joint, then it may not produce the desired effect. Why does it so? Technique. Because in shoulder, there are a lot of different ways you can give. You can give it from the front of the shoulder, you can give it from the back of the shoulder. There are several different ways you can give the shoulder. So in general, nowadays most arthroscopic surgeons who do regular shoulder arthroscopy prefer to give the injection from the posterior aspect. The same portal that they use to reach the joint, they use it. That ensures that you are reliably able to enter into the joint and deliver the drug. The second thing is use of small needles. When you, the commonly what we do is this uh, injection in the shoulder is done as an office procedure in the OPD. So we tend to use our routine 1 or 1.5 inch needle. If the patient is muscular or if the patient is little obese and if you are going in from the posterolateral portal, uh, from the posterolateral corner of the acromion, the needle may not be of sufficient length to go into the joint and it may stop short of the intra-articular portion. So you may not be actually delivering the drug into the joint. So it's preferable when you have a muscular patient or a thick patient to use a spinal needle so that you are able to reliably deliver the drug into the shoulder joint. The other thing is when you have a very muscular patient or you are not sure because the capsule is very thick whether you are penetrating it or not, you can take the help of the radiologist and then you can give a block, uh, give an uh, injection under the ultrasound guidance so that the drug is delivered exactly into the joint and that will give a good pain relief. In advanced or severe cases, sometimes the patient might require more than one injection. But again, as I told, it is not because it is only a short term benefit, but because the disease is more active, more inflammation is there, they are requiring additional injections. So the other common entity is rotator cuff tears. The rotator cuff tears can be a partial tear, only a few fibers are torn. Even the partial tear can be on the articular surface or it can be within the muscle fibers or it can be present on the uh, articular, on the uh, bursal side. Sometimes it's a full thickness tear where the entire muscle is torn. So arthroscopically when you see this is how the partial tear occurs, reduction in the thickness of the tendon. 
This is the full thickness tear where you can see the humeral head from the bursal side. So, here in rotator cuff tears, active movement patient is not actively able to move the shoulder, but if you hold the patient's arm and try to lift it, they are able to have movement at the shoulder. This is in difference with the frozen shoulder where whether they are trying to do or you try to do the movement is restricted. But in rotator cuff tear they will not be able to do but somebody with assistance or somebody is lifting the arm with the opposite arm they will be able to lift the arm. Partial tears are more painful than full thickness tear and rotator cuff tears are very common in MRIs. If you do MRI in 100 normal people in 30 people you might even find a rotator cuff tear. But all the tears that are seen in the MRI do not require a repair because more it depends upon the clinical evaluation to see only those tasks in which the function is decompensated, only those tasks require a repair and all MRI tasks do not require a repair. So if it's a traumatic tear, you can do an early repair. In a degenerative tear, the decision needs to be individualized based on the age of the patient, functional status, whether there is retraction or not, whether there is any fatty infiltration into the tip, uh, muscle is wasted and there is only fatty fibers present and no muscle fibers present and the healing potential of the patient. So, this is the common thing that uh, uh, we see here. See, this is a thing where there are a condition called as irreparable tear. If there is a tear, the muscle tends to retract. This is an MRI, this is the humeral head and this is the uh, shoulder blade and this is the rotator cuff muscle. There is a tear and the muscle is relatively near the insertion. It is easy to do a repair. But if it gets retracted, for example, more than 2 to 3 centimeter or it goes beyond the glenoid margin, then this tear is occurring in an elderly patient because of degeneration, even if you try to bring it here, it may not be successful. During the surgery, you might somehow try and bring it here and keep it here. But what happens is because of the poor quality of the tissue, it would again have a retard. So, if there is a tear with very significant amount of uh, distraction, wherefore it has moved away from the insertion site and then the muscle has been undergone atrophy or there is fatty changes into the muscle, these tears are not repairable. When you have such a tear and the patient is still having like that, you end up with a condition called as rotator cuff arthropathy. These are images from patients seen in our, our own hospital. If you see the humeral head has gone up, it is migrating up and then it is articulating with the acromion. It has become like a pseudo articulation here. You see here, it is developing secondary congruence. It has become like a joint here. So the humeral head starts moving up and articulating with the acromion. This is called as a rotator cuff acro uh, arthropathy. This is the extreme case. In this case, the treatment is to undergo a reverse shoulder arthroplasty where you change the surfaces and then produce a, this one. So shoulder replacement, normally this is the shoulder where you have the arm bone and the ball at the top and then this is the cup in the shoulder blade. This is the normal shoulder and this is the normal shoulder replacement. If you see here, we have put the cup back on the shoulder blade and then the ball here on the head. What we do in a irreparable rotator cuff tear or rotator cuff tear is we do a reverse shoulder. Here the ball instead of being present on the humeral head is put on the glenoid and the cup instead of being present on the glenoid has come to the humerus. So by this we are altering the entire biomechanics so that the patient is able to lift the arm even without the rotator cuff by changing the biomechanics. So coming to the younger age group. There are only a few more slides left. Is anyone bored? Okay, good. So, shoulder instability is a common cause of pain in young individual. When an young individual comes and complains of pain, the first thing that should come to our mind is shoulder instability. We tend always to believe, as I told you before, that frank recurrent dislocations as instability. But that is only one end of the spectrum and that is the less common type of instability. The more common one is the micro instability where the humeral head kind of moves little bit towards the edge of the glenoid over the labrum but it actually does not dislocate but it comes back. So this is the micro instability and the next thing is patient might have recurrent subluxation. The patient says whenever I do some movement I feel like the shoulder is moving and then it comes back to position. So that is recurrent subluxation and the extreme end is where you have the recurrent frank dislocations occurring. So whenever an young patient comes, we need to examine for subtle signs of instability. The other clue is whenever the patient has generalized ligamentous laxity, when they are able to uh, have hyperextension at the elbow, hyperextension at the knee and then they are able to extend the metacarpophalangeal joints for more than 90 degree, the patient is very tall, some generalized ligamentous laxity, we should always suspect micro instability in these patients. So, instability, presence of shoulder pain, young patient with shoulder pain, always we need to think about instability. Subluxations are more common than dislocations. So, as I told you, this is the glenoid labrum. The glenoid per se is like a saucer, it is like a 
plate and then if you place a ball on it, it has a tendency to come out and what happens is the labrum which is a cartilage, it is like a wall and then it forms a layer all around so that it gives concavity, it forms like a cup so that the head can remain in it. What happens in instability when the patient gets recurrent subluxations or dislocations, the labrum gets torn. Particularly in patients with the first dislocation, which when it occurs violently, this tears a portion of the glenoid in the front. So, with further dislocations, when the arm comes to that position, it automatically starts coming out and then with further dislocation, the tear starts extending proximally. So, when the patient comes to us after the first dislocation, there is no consensus in literature on how long we should immobilize the patient or for in what position we should immobilize. And then when the, the consensus we have is when the person is young, because in the younger age of first dislocation, there is a high chance of recurrence with uh, uh, younger age. So, if it is a young person and he is actively involved in sports and he has a structural lesion, then he requires an arthroscopic intervention, an arthroscopic stabilization so as to prevent instability. If it is a non-sporting person, relatively uh, sedentary job, even though he is young and there is no structural lesions in the MRI, you can put him on a rehabilitative training where you strengthen the muscles with isometric and isotonic strengthening so that the shoulder develops the stability and then you can treat them with rehabilitation alone. So, this is in short. So, what I told you about the labrum is torn from the, the cartilage is torn from the bone here. In the next stage what we do is we put something called as a suture anchor, a tack that goes in and then two threads are coming out and now we have a small instrument that will go through the labrum and then take one of the threads outside and then what we do is we put a knot and then we push it in and then we tighten it and then we do this so that we till we repair the entire structure. So, by doing this we are facilitating healing of the labrum back to the bone again so that the shoulder remains stable. So, this is what we do in a bank card. When you have the labrum intact, we do a bank card. But sometimes what happens when the patient comes with 7 dislocations, 10 dislocations, the tissue has become so atrophic, you are not able to see a labrum separately because it is torn and then it is gone. So, in those cases, we do something called as a capsulolabral reconstruction. So, whatever capsule and labrum we are able to see, we do a imbrication, we tighten it to the glenoid so that it reduces the volume of the shoulder. It gives a tightness and stability to the shoulder. If all these procedures are not working, then we need to go to this bony procedure where we move the coracoid and do a uh, coracoid transfer with a conjoint tendon that is called a lethargy, that is an open procedure. So, these slides I am going to skip because when there is recurrent dislocation, there is going to be loss of bone as well. So, when the bone loss becomes significant, then we need to treat the bone loss as well while treating the instability. This is another procedure remplissage where we attach the capsule to the humeral head to make it less uh, this one. Then the second entity common in young people is the labral tear, the superior labral tear where the biceps tendon is attaching in people who are involved in overhead throwing activities, if they are involved in like I see a lot of people doing a fishing repeatedly, they are throwing there, they can develop the superior labral tear. In water sports, they can develop a superior labral tear. When they have a superior labral tear, where the biceps tendon is attaching to the labrum and the glenoid, when they have a tear, then they can have a pain in the shoulder in young people. So, when you have a tear, we put suture anchors, but at the superior aspect and repair them back. So, role of exercise physiotherapy in shoulder. Exercise plays a very crucial and an integral part in the management of all shoulder issues. More than 75 percent of the shoulder issues can be treated with exercise physiotherapy alone. Physiotherapy I do not mean the modality, but with exercises, exercise physiotherapy alone. But improper physio can cause actual damage to the shoulder. Lot of times patients have shoulder pain, after that they look into the YouTube, Google and then they start doing exercises. I told you in an impingement, the basic problem is the acromion is not opening and letting the humeral head go up. So, you need to first strengthen the scapular muscle so that it is opening. What people do? They go to the gym, they have a big wheel, they try to start spinning it. What happens? The acromion is not opening, you are banging the humeral head against it repeatedly. So, multiple micro injuries occur and that can lead to a tear in the rotator cuff. So, it needs to be a proper program where you address the main pathology so that the exercise can actually give benefit to the patient. So, pain after physiotherapy, this is a common thing. They did some exercise, after that the patient says, whenever I do exercise, I have pain. So, I am not doing the exercise. This is a common thing patient comes back to and say. If after physiotherapy, they have a dull ache for 10 to 15 minutes and if it gets relieved with ice, then there is nothing to worry, it should continue with the exercises. But if the pain lasts for 30 minutes or more, it is a very sharp severe pain and it is worse than what 
they started with then probably it is not helping they are not doing the exercise right. So, then they need to stop the exercise and have a review. So, this is one common issue that I see in Maldives. I have seen shoulder patients in lot of countries, but this issue is more common here. I am not sure like orthopedic surgeons here might be able to say. Calcific tendinitis I do not know, but I see more the all these are patients from our clinic. Calcific tendinitis seems to be very, very common here. The problem with calcific tendinitis is though it appears to uh, sit in the space and reduce the space thereby making it prone to impingement. It is very difficult to remove this calcium when you go in with arthroscopy because most of the time the calcium deposition is within the muscle. It is clearly seen on the x-ray, but when you go into the joint with an arthroscope, you are either going to see on the superior surface of the muscle or on the under surface of the muscle. So, when the calcium deposition is within the muscle, you are not going to be able to see that and then it is not possible to completely remove the calcific deposits as well. So, in when there is a calcific tendinitis, the initial treatment during the phase when the calcium is getting deposited, it is acute severe pain that the patient comes with and at that time you may not be able to see the calcium deposits also in the x-ray, MRI may show changes. At at the time the main treatment is anti-inflammatory physiotherapy and rest with controlled movement to the shoulder. When you have a very clear cut thing and then there is an impingement and if it is on the surface maybe we can try to remove the calcific deposits. The other thing, I have a couple more slides. I think the IT guys are trying to make me stop the talk. Huh? They are bored and sleeping. Only two more slides guys. <laughs> Did I accidentally press one of those buttons here? So, the other condition that is very common uh, here that I see is the rotator cuff arthropathy where they have a tear and then they just uh, uh, try to manage it without the thing. They continue to have disability and then the humeral head rides up and then so the humeral head goes up and then it creates an articulation between the uh, acromion and the humeral head. So, this is other common condition that uh, is more commonly seen uh, in our patients here. So, for this as I told you before the treatment is reverse shoulder. Yes. So, finally facts to carry. More than 70 percent of the shoulder issues can be treated with proper exercises alone. The modality therapy like IFT ultrasound helps relieve the pain so that the patient are able to comfortably do the exercises. Exercise physio should address the basic pathological process. If you do a non-specific or non-random exercises, you may end up doing some damage. So, the exercise needs to be focused addressing the pathological process. Differentiating between impingement and frozen shoulder is vital. Intraarticular corticosteroids are disease modifying in frozen shoulder when given at the appropriate time and into the joint. All tears that you see on the MRI do not necessarily require a surgery, only those with a decompensated function require a surgery. When indicated arthroscopic rotator cuff repair is a very, very effective procedure. Thank you all. Any questions? Yes. Uh, see, there are centers, orthopedic centers that high volume centers, they do exclusively mini open repairs and there are centers that do only arthroscopic. Literature wise, objectively there is no difference in the outcome between a mini open as well as in the arthroscopic. Both of them are going to give the same results. But in the immediate period, the post operative pain and then uh, the ability with which they are able to move in the immediate post operative period is much better with the arthroscopic rotator cuff repair. But functionally at the end of 2 years if you see both of them might have the same functional results. 
but uh, arthroscopy is less traumatic to the tissues as compared to an open approach. In open approach, a lot of time, particularly when you have a curved or a hooped acromion, you may not get enough exposure. So you need to use a micro saw, you need to take off a uh, acromion to get access and then to do a repair. But in arthroscopy, you are going in straight, you are able to see and then you are able to do that. Second thing is, when you are doing an arthroscopy, you can address not only the supraspinatus, you get a good visualization of infraspinatus and the massive cuff you can do. Sometimes when you are doing a mini open, you might find it restrictive. If you do a full open where you do an acromial resection and stuff, then you might get a good visualization. Thank you, Ria.